Okay, you kind of led into it with the for Licione uh, part. Um, you know, talk to me about uh, growing up in Rochester and growing up in an Italian household. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a lot of very happy memories as a kid in in Rochester, despite the snow, because I also back then there was a lot like the, there was an ice storm. There was like heavy, much, much more intense snowfall. But I remember a lot of playing outside. I remember making sauce with my dad every Sunday since before I can remember. This was this was every Sunday, Sinatra, Sinatra Sunday. <laughs> so food was was just so much a part of the culture and when I went to my dad's family's house it was the same way so it was very important to him to kind of keep these traditions going with his kids and uh and we again you know those recipes now I I have my three-year-old boys they're in the kitchen already we're like okay we're gonna make some eggplant parmigiana today okay boys pay attention this is beans and greens <laughs> These are, you know, life lessons. And then also there, there were a lot of other Italian Americans in Rochester. So it, it was like, you, you don't even have to say anything. Can you just do a hand gesture? They know exactly what you're saying. And, and there was certain language and, and there was certain energy that I, I always really, really liked. And, and I remember as a kid, just, just looking up to these guys and becoming friends with their kids. So I have some I have some good good memories of food and family and very just just loud over the top Italian New Yorkers. <laughs> Love it. Uh, so we'll come back to your dad and growing up in Rochester a bit because I know that's sort of the subject of the show that you're you're um, you're you're doing at Fringe. So we're not going to get too much into that right now. Um, I do want to circle to you know you know one thing I always found is you know talking with performers, especially comedians. Uh, is there usually seems to be uh, a moment or an event or a club or th there always seemed to be like some kind of crystallized thing that made you realize that, oh, that's it. I am doing what I want to do. I want to be a comedian. I want to be a performer. Uh, did you have that? If so, what was it? Uh, well, comedy, you know, doing stand up and labeling myself as a comedian, that was the last thing mm. to, to come. But the first thing was dance. And that was at age three. So I, there was no choice. There was absolutely no choice that it, it found me. And it was immediate. It was like, it was love at first sight. Love at first, a full ball change. <laughs> I, I absolutely loved it. So from the moment that first dance class, I still remember it. And my dad took a picture of me and he gave me that photo that I still have to this day. He said, remember how long you've been doing this? I loved it so much. So it was dance and musical theater, but comedy, I was always cast as the comic relief in theater, in musical comedy. I was always funny, but I was still a dancer and more of an actor. Um, and it wasn't until years later that on accident, <laughs> which that also happens, I was hosting a charity event in San Francisco and there were massive, massive technical difficulties. And these were people that they invited, you know, to, to donate money to help for the children's hospital. So it was, it was very, you know, they're like, oh my God. Oh my God. So they pushed me on stage. They're like, Nina, you're funny. Just go do something funny. And I just made fun of this situation <laughs> and I had done some improv in college at the time. And I now know what I did is called crowd work. I didn't know that then I just started asking them questions and telling stories based on what they told me. And we ended up having a really great time. And I ended up having them do like a whole rhythm at the end and, and we improvised. And then the next thing, you know, everything was back to normal. And we're like, all right, let's have a show. Afterwards, many people were like, oh, you do stand up, right? I'm like, no, I, I was like, no, I no. <laughs> you should. So I, I, again, I said, yes. And, you know, I was like, you know what, I'll give it a try. If I don't like it, oh, at least I tried. And, and I loved it. I was like, oh my gosh, there's no character. There's, 
it, it's me. It's all me. It's my thoughts. I'm not hiding behind a character. And it was a very different, unique experience. And and here we are. <laughs> very cool. I know. Like sometimes I'm I'm at I I don't know if I'm funny or not. People tell me I am, and I said. Just because I can stand up and tell a joke doesn't mean I can do stand-up comedy. So, um, <laughs> you I, never know. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know. So you said, I mean, you got in, you know, to dance and singing and performing uh, first, and then kind of comedy found you later. Uh, as most comedians do, they do research, whether it's sort of experiencing life, and that's your research, or your people watching, or if you're more historical comic, you might read. Um, but part of that is also taking in other comedians and seeing what they do, what they like. Who are, as you were sort of developing your comic style, obviously improv was a big part of it for you. Who are some of your comedy influences, people you looked up to or modeled yourself after? Who, who, what kind of artists are your guiding stars? I'm going to go really old school. I was obsessed with Lucille Ball. I was obsessed with, with her show. I loved her physical comedy. And that was more... That was my thing since I was very young, was more physical comedy. So I really was drawn to that. And then also my dad used to listen to Richard Pryor, George Carlin, of course, and Joan Rivers and Rodney Dangerfield. And Rodney Dangerfield always had this very expressive face and expressive eyes and Bernie Mac, oh, his eyes would say everything for them. So I'm, I'm really drawn towards the more physical comedians and the storytellers. Dave Chappelle right now, hands down. Um, I, I, I love Dave Chappelle as, as, as a, he's a great person and he's a great comedian and his social commentary is just amazing. So I think I've evolved as an artist. I, I really love the physical comedies like Robin Williams, ah, Billy Crystal. Billy Crystal, I love him. John Leguizamo, his one man shows like free changed my life when I saw that on Broadway. I was like, oh, you can do that? Because it wasn't stand up, but it wasn't quite theater. It was it was a mix of all these things. And I, I started realizing like, that's me. I, you can do all of these different things. And also now with, you know, you, you get a bit older and wiser and more comfortable in your knowledge. And there's some, you know, I love to make people laugh, but in the end, if I can also maybe make you think, that's 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 everything, you know? And if, if you can attack a negative stereotype or do some social commentary without forcing it down people's throats, instead of doing like a very smart, well-researched joke, <laughs> then a <laughs> for me that's 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 like the ultimate you know having a, a higher purpose in in anything you do whether it's stand up comedy art cooking uh plumbing why not mm -hmm. hey man plumbing's important we need it, toilets <laughs> it's true uh so talking about you know, so much of comedy is uh context too right you're setting up a context and you might subvert the context uh, context changes a lot when you go very far from home. And I can only imagine that for a boisterous uh, Rochesterian Italian American with tattoos moving to uh, <laughs> Dubai was quite a culture change. Um, so, yes. so why did you want to move there besides getting away from the snow? Uh, why did you want to move there? And um, what were some cultural differences that you found that either made it challenging or made it a place that would that allowed you to be successful? Well, I uh, when I was first asked to come here it was just it was a booking you know it was a gig and I it's like 2007 so I didn't know anything I was like Dubai what's Dubai I remember like googling it and trying to get information and I you know honestly I just heard Middle East and American media wasn't very positive when it came to the Middle East <laughs> mm -hmm. but I again it was like that yes and you know I there were so many arrows pointing in this direction, I thought, you know what, let me give it, a, let me give it a shot. It's just, it's just a few weeks. It's to perform at a festival. And when I got here, I was stunned. I was like, this is not at all <laughs> what I had imagined. And everyone was so like kind. It was very safe. Everything was so clean and so brand new. And a lot of the local Emirati 
men and women. The women wear abaya and shalas and the men are in kandora. And, and honestly, I had a lot of questions. And thankfully, very thankfully, these the whole team, the, the production team for the festival were so patient, so patient. And I said, I, just, I had questions and they were like, please, we're so happy to answer them. There was an open dialogue from day one. I started understanding more about a Muslim country, more about the history of the UAE and, and how it came about and the dream behind it. I asked a lot of specific questions too about, oh, does this mean something? Does that mean something? And again, I was really very blessed to have very patient people. And in return, they were like, so you're telling Americans your dad's in the mall. <laughs> So it was the flip side. They're like, oh my God, I love the Sopranos. Oh, the Sopranos. Oh, I love it. Bada bing, bada boobs. Bada bing, bada boobs. You know, we're like, no, no, no. It's bada bing, bada boom. Okay. <laughs> you can tell me. I won't tell anybody. Your Bubba, he's got Bubba. It was, there were so many, like, especially the men, they just love mob movies. So they were so excited. <laughs> to get to ask questions on the other side. So it was a really open dialogue. And Arabs, I found, are a lot more sim similar to Italians than I ever realized. We're all about food and olive oil and family. We're loud. We're proud. We're hairy, especially us women. We, and I was like, oh, you got a mustache too, girl. Hey! <laughs> But they're really, we're like Mediterranean cousins. So going to my now husband's family's house, it was like, you know, here it's Friday is, is their equivalent to a Sunday, but having that Friday, you know, lunch where the whole family comes together, they're making all of the food, the music is playing. I, I honestly, it made me very nostalgic for, from when I was growing up. So I love, there's, there's so many similarities if, if you get the chance to dig deeper and ask a lot of questions. Well, I do think uh, Sicily was occupied by a Muslim country yes. at one point. So yes. th th there's bound to be some crossover there. I do want to come back to your growing up because we're almost at that point of the interview, but I would be remiss. I'm, I'm not going to pronounce this right, but I'm going to give it a go. Uh, do, do bot how did the, the, the women group that you, you found, do bottom is that right? My, uh, I hear you say Dubomity. Dubomity. Okay. Yeah. It's like uh, Dubai. I would and comedy exactly. and we the bomb. So it's like do bombity. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about that. <laughs> well, I, when I had first come here, it was just for the gig. And I, I met a lot of people and they kept saying, there's no local comedy here. There's only people that are flown in, but please, we, we'd love to, to, to kind of, to, why don't you come start workshops? Why don't you come start a comedy night? And I kept getting booked to do stand up, MC, perform, teach, do all kinds of stuff. And I was like, all right, you know what? Let me think about it. And maybe I'll just come back for a year and start to build something. And the cornerstone to anything, I think sustainability wise is, is training, you know, some type of education. If, if a lot of people didn't know stand up. Um, and Arabic comedy is very different than English comedy. It's more storytelling, a lot more acting, and it's stories that are handed down. It's oral tradition, you know, so it was very different. And I met my, my now husband at the time. Um, he was uh, a guy who really loved comedy and wanted to build something. And we met and we had the same vision as like using comedy as a tool to bring people of many different backgrounds, religious backgrounds, cultures together for a laugh and to build something from the ground up. And we started uh, Dabami, the comedy school and the workshops. And then we started events. And then from that came lots of comedy festivals. And then Comedy Central Arabia came in. So there's been like just all these platforms and we still don't have a comedy industry. We're not there yet, but it's growing really fast. and. And it's really, it's crazy and it's really exciting to see that, you know, it's like if you've ever been to McDonald's around the world, I know this is the only example I can think of. They always have something local. On, <laughs> they localize their menu. With a comedian, you have to localize. If you're on tour, you're going to go out, you're going to experience the city, you're going to start your set. You know, the first 10 minutes is about that city usually, so you can connect. 
And for us, we're like, we're not just going to take, okay, this is stand up. This is what works in America and New York and Chicago and just plop it in. We, we had to adjust many, there's 200 and I think 222 nationalities. It's more than the Olympics live in this country. English is not the first language. So we have a lot of, you know, there was a lot of barriers in the beginning. Um, and we all find, we, we, we focused on the similarities, the frustrations and, um, and the laughter. And here we are now it's like, wow, it's been since 2008. So <laughs> it just keeps on going. And now the, the folks that we've mentored, they have their own nights and they've gone international and, and it's, um, it's something special, you know, it's, it's like, who would have thought, you know? Who would have thought? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Yes, and that's the key. Uh, exactly. You got to you got to yes and it. Here is the part in the interview where a lot of our themes are coming full circle from Lucille de Liguizamo to growing up to cultural differences to code switching, all the stuff. Um, I couldn't I couldn't help but make an observation here that your dad being a boxing promoter and you doing dance probably means you both have pretty good feet to stand on. Uh, so talk to me a little bit about the show growing up ringside. What does it explore? What does the show look like? That sort of thing. Well, it started, I, I structured it. What made sense to me was rounds. So my first structure, my first was 12 rounds. Cause I was like, okay, 12 rounds. And I quickly realized that's going to be a four hour show. So I'm going to save that for the book version. <laughs> <laughs> then I narrowed it down. I was like, that's the Scorsese, Scorsese version. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I had to kind of narrow it down and then narrow it down again. And it's hard when it's autobiographical because you're like, okay, well, I, this is my life, but what's the most important key elements, which moments can you not, not have to tell this story? And I've narrowed it down to seven rounds and, and it kind of comes all full circle. And the fact that I'm performing it in Rochester, that in itself is going to be like, Oh my God, if I don't, I'm probably going to cry. It's going to happen. Probably ugly cry. Um, but it starts off just, you know, 1980s Rochester, New York. I really paint that, that picture and it's a multimedia show and that it has to be. The magic of the multimedia, it takes you back in time. And especially for people who have never been to New York or never hung out in an Italian American family's home, like house, this is really putting you in the vibe. So as soon as people enter, you got Sinatra, Dean Martin, Louis Prima playing. You have slides of old footage from um, boxing, old boxers from Rochester, like Carmen Basilio, Willie Pep, um, times that they came to visit, like Muhammad Ali and George Foreman, all these fighters that my dad, you know, worked with and old pictures of my dad. So the vibe as you walk in, it, it has to transport you to, to be in this certain zone. So I'm really using the pre-show um, as that. It's not just like, hey, go find your seats. No, I'm, it's a vibe. It's an, I wanted to, it's an experience. And then it starts with the round one is, is basically the, you know, behind the scenes and setting the tone. And then it moves on to me moving to New York city. And then it moves on to, you know, land. I, I don't want, I don't know spoilers, but there's some very important turns in my career. And there's also some very <sighs> important um, accidents and moments um, that we had to fight through. There were some bad times that we kind of had to overcome. And then it brings us to Dubai and this whole, this whole different world. And my husband's Muslim and I'm raised Roman Catholic. So you can only imagine my family coming to meet his family and how that went and the wedding and both of these families kind of breaking ne negative stereotypes and really embracing each other. And dare I say, love each other. Like our families love each other now. And there's a, a very beautiful understanding. And throughout it though, it's funny. <laughs> it doesn't sound funny when I'm talking about it, but there, it's very heartfelt. It's very funny. And there are some very painful moments, but then uplifting moments. And then I make you laugh again. So it's a bit of a roller coaster. And at the heart of it is really the relationship between 
a dad and his daughter and, mm. and the support that he had for me and his passion ignited my passion. He was my hero. He's the funniest man I've ever met. Oh, I'm, my, my husband's a comedian now. So now I have to say that the, they're both the funniest <laughs> men I ever met. <laughs> And my grandpa is really funny. Hmm. So I guess I, you know, I, I like to be surrounded by like, you know, strong, funny people. But uh, that, that's, I, that's my journey. It's my journey. I love it. Uh, I do have to ask. Um, yeah, I think the promo shot is you and the warmups and boxing gloves. Did you learn yeah. how to box for this? Is that is that part of this, or is that is well? It... I learned to box when I was a kid. Right. I I I, I oh, is self defense. You know what I mean? My dad will always say, "This is my dad's tagline: keep punching, keep punching." And he before, especially, I left uh, Rochester to go to Manhattan at seventeen by myself. No way he was going to let me go without having some street smarts and some self defense. We always had a huge boxing, you know, we had a punching bag downstairs. We had a speed bag. So it, it honestly, I've been doing that since I was really young. I used to go to the gyms and they'd always be like, Hey, you want to jump rope? I'm like, yeah, sure. But I want the bag. <laughs> like I might be a little girl, like this is fun, but I want the bag. <laughs> so that was kind of like, it was, it was part of growing up. It, it was just part of it. You know, it was, it didn't seem weird or unusual. That was just part of it. Yeah. I do want to circle back to one thing because it is on my list and I didn't ask about it. Is it okay. true that your dad still hasn't seen this show? It is very true. Oh God, you're really going to be crying if he's in the front row. I don't want him in the front row. I don't <laughs> want him. He can't be. I know. I don't want like... him ringside. I'm going to be staring at him the whole time. He has to be a little bit back. He has to be. And also there are going to be some jokes that he's going to be like, Maron. Uh, you know, so it's a little, and then he's going to, and then sometimes he's going to be teary eyed. Sometimes he's going to put his head down. I don't want to see him. I don't want to look at him until the end. But the only thing he knows is the footage because he has, he had boxes and boxes filled with old VHS tapes of these old boxing interviews and fights. And a lot of the stuff was in Rochester, all these old photographs that were like sticking together. So he got everything converted um, and everything, like all these pictures scanned and stuff. So we got to relook at all of these old pictures together, which was incredible. So he knows that element of it. And I asked him a lot of questions. We, you know, we, we did a lot of Zoom calls and stuff, especially during the pandemic, because I couldn't go there. You know, like they were, they finally got the grandkids they were praying for and asking for, and I couldn't take my, you know, I have twins now. I couldn't take them to go see your grandparents. So I was like, okay, let's do this project. So that's all he really knows is I asked him a lot of questions. We told a lot of stories. He saw some footage, but he has, and he keeps saying to me, he's like, what's the show about? He's like, he's like, I I'm nervous. And I'm like, I'm the nervous one, but he, he doesn't know. My mom doesn't know. And she's a big part of it. And actually she's kind of the comic relief of the show. Funny enough. So she's going to be like, Oh my God, I can't believe you said that. I have to come back tomorrow and watch the other. Yeah. Oh, geez. Patty relax. That was great. I loved it. It was beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> You'll hear this conversation back and forth after the show. <laughs> What about Rochester made it uh, such a great place for you and other original comedians, performers to thrive? What about Rochester makes that work? Okay. I am going to say two names was Timothy Draper, who was uh, the ballet, the OG ballet Devo and Garth Fagan. Mm -hmm. He's, I went to Brockport High School and they had a 313 program. If you had grades high enough, when you were a senior, you could leave half day and take college classes at SUNY Brockport. So I took class, of course, with Garth Fagan <laughs> and, and Mr. Draper. And I got my butt kicked by them. They were just like over the top and, and I loved it. They were, go on the floor. No, do it again. Do it, do that. And for me, my parents were like, this is a test. If you can handle this on top of, you know, I also train at performance plus dance studio. And I was there all the time. I got a, I got a, a job there as an assistant teacher to help pay for the lessons. This training 
between Performance Plus Dance Studio, Garth Fagan, Timothy Draper, and very supportive parents. That base has taken me all the way here. Without that, I, I, I don't know. I don't know, you know, mm-hmm. I'm like, wow. And all the bakeries, Gruderius, with always our favorite bakeries. Etna's, I love their cannoli. We got to talk about food. Come on. It's, it's, it's true. <laughs> like you, you can't perform without fuel. It's true. No, and Wegmans, you know, I, I love Wegmans. It's not, it's not just a store. It's like a lifestyle. You know, you go on the, the one in Monroe Avenue. You're just like, oh, hi. <laughs> you're oh, like, yeah. oh, hi. I, I I grew up like five minutes from that Wegman, so I know. Good one. Yeah. It's a good one. It's good. Okay. Uh, we've talked a lot about what you have done. This question is about what you want to do or what you will do. Um, what is the next thing that you want to accomplish, the next feather in your hat that you're looking to do in your career? Well, <laughs> this show, I, I had slight, I had mentioned briefly John Leguizamo and Billy Crystal as two of my just, I love them. I really love their, specifically their one man shows. I, I was, I'm really in awe of them and they were able to encompass their, their stories and, and have it be funny, but heartfelt, but then take it to Broadway. So I would love to take this show for to Broadway for however long of a run, I would love to film it. And I would love for it to live on HBO. <laughs> We'll get this to him. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And then also my husband and I have been working on a series kind of about two comedians from two very different worlds, two different religious backgrounds, mm-hmm. you know, uh, kind of living together. So we have that in the pipeline as well. But that that's kind of both of us for both of us. We're like, oh, that's that's going to be the series that we really want to film in this coming year. And uh, when we were in lockdown, oh yeah, we have a lot of material. <laughs> we're like, hey man, put it in your art. Don't let it go in vain. So we've been writing a lot. So those are those are the two. Those are the two ones. Beautiful. And one more. <laughs> Do you have any advice for aspiring artists, comedians, or performers? Oh my gosh, yes, I definitely, definitely do. And I think so many people when I was young, except my parents, which is interesting, told me, oh, it's going to be too hard. Oh, it's going to be too hard. How are you going to pay your rent? How are you going to do this? And you have to, no, you have to like, and you appreciate that sometimes people are just genuinely concerned but if you have this passion and that's all you can think about and, and, and you love it so much, you, you have to follow it. And I did, I, I, you know, I was on the fence about whether or not to get a degree because for me, I was like out of the gate. I was like, I'm 17. I want to go to Broadway. And my parents were just like, no, you have to go to school. And I'm very grateful that I did because now I have my master's. And now I can teach anywhere in the world. I teach theater, I teach dance, I teach comedy. And I started comedy, the first comedy school in the Middle East because of that degree. And a lot of people were like, oh, an arts degree ain't going to do anything for you. I'm living proof. It definitely, definitely does. And you need it. You need an MFA to be able to teach and kind of give it back. And another thing is to always write. Don't get lazy. You cannot get lazy. I use notes on my phone. Every time I see something funny or think of a funny line or or a frustrating experience happens, or sometimes it's just something so beautiful, I need to take a picture of it. But you have to document it or else it's gone forever. So just keep writing down these ideas and then get your butt in the studio and don't get lazy. That's my, that's my advice. 